All right, this is Tubbs. Photos taken right before disasters. You know what I'm saying? We've been lacking on Tubbs a little bit, but we back, baby. We back, baby. We back, baby. Y'all ready? Hey guys, welcome back to another video. My name is Tub, and today we're going to be talking hey, about photos that were taken before disasters. Okay. Before we do get into that, I do want to say, how are you guys? I hope life's been treating you good. I That's hope sure. February 14th was eventful to some degree. And I do want to remind you guys that we're very close to 2 million subscribers. Ugh. If you are a new viewer, I'll let you know that you don't have to subscribe. I'll earn your subscription by the end of this video. I do, however, want to say that today's video is on the more serious side. I know all the videos on the channel are morbid, but some are more serious than others. And this this video is one of those. With that being said, let's get straight to the topic. Garrett Miller's last photo. I'm angry. I feel like Garrett was let down. I feel like we've been let down. We feel like something near and dear and precious to us has been ripped out of our hearts. Those were the words of a distraught Dave Mills speaking to the press after losing his son, 15-year-old Garrett Mills, to a rather pointless accident. Garrett Mills died on May 12, 2017 at King Street Park in Nipani, Ontario, Canada, shortly after leaving school while hanging out with both his girlfriend and best friend. Just about 10 minutes before his death, these photos had been taken, and they quite accurately captured the mood that he was in. In the first photo, you can make out, though faintly, that behind his ear, he had tucked in a flower, a dandelion to be more specific. Then oh, the I second photo has him flexing his muscles for the camera. In both photos, he's smiling. This is actually confirmed by what was reported. According to this article, Garrett's girlfriend had told his dad that Garrett had said that was the, quote, best day of his life. It also helps, but is rather Damn. saddening to know, that the trio had been hanging out at King Street Park to kill time ahead of Garrett's first ever official date with his girlfriend, which would have been at the movies later that evening. So, what happened to Garrett 10 minutes after these photos were taken? Well, a goal post fell on him, killing him instantly. Apparently, he had been showing off a little bit for his girlfriend and started doing chin-ups on the soccer crossbar. Unfortunately, the whole thing tipped over and hit him on the head. As his dad put Damn. it, it just simply tipped over on him and the crossbar struck him on the left side of his head, killing him instantly. He also added that based on the coroner's report, his death was instantaneous. Some other specific details that emerged included the fact that the goalpost was a bit of an older model, which meant most of the weight was at the top. We're talking 180 to 200 pounds. Damn. Also, it wasn't anchored down. The father phrased it as, quote, needless and not needing to have happened. He also went on to say that based on his knowledge of the park, he had no idea it carried such a risk. His exact words mean that he never thought, quote, this harmless park had the potential to take somebody's life, end quote. Damn. And that goalpost was immediately replaced with this one, which is anchored down. That, however, didn't stop Garrett's dad from committing to getting justice. While saying he was wasn't out to get blood, he explained that he for sure knew someone dropped the ball and he was going to find out who, quote unquote, whether it was budget, whether it was just neglect or forgetfulness. I would say that this is a very understandable course of action, given that in the past, other parents have done so and succeeded in not only getting justice, but helping prevent this to happening to other people. I'm specifically referring to a case in 2003 where a 184 pound goalpost in the same manner as this one fell on six year old Zachary Tran, prompting his parents to push for an Illinois law to remedy the situation. The push resulted in Zach's law, which basically required all goalposts in Illinois to be impossible to trip, whether anchored or movable. All that being said- God damn, why the fuck are them shit so heavy? Like, I can get why they- Like, I'd rather them be not as heavy and anchored down than just, you know what I'm saying? Niggas made it overly heavy and not anchored down. Which, wouldn't, I'd rather you just anchored a bit down or something. Like, damn, that's crazy said though it remains quite unnerving knowing that just 10 minutes after these pictures were taken garrett would pass on damn 10 minutes and he was so happy flight bro. 17. in july of 2014 a malaysia airlines boeing 777 plane specifically flight 17 in an evidently very tragic event got shot down by a russian made surface to air missile while on its scheduled path an 11 and a half hour flight from amsterdam to kuala lumpur malaysia the accident caused quite a stir as it bordered on being or maybe was a politically motivated attack with russia being accused but refusing any responsibility as recently as last year the investigations were still ongoing with allegations of possible involvement by Putin. Now, there's a whole lot to say about that situation, but let's just focus on this photo here. This photo was actually taken shortly after boarding by a father and, as you might guess, it's of his wife and daughter. Apparently- Damn. 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 You just never know. It's so insane. You never know. 
Finally, Dave Holly, the father, and his wife, Kim Holly, were on that flight headed to their dream holiday in Malaysia together with their four-year-old daughter, Megan. Unknown to Dave, this would be the last photo he'd ever take, and it would be a photo that their families would use to comfort themselves, telling themselves that, well, at least they were all together and happy. Monique, the sister, talking to CNN, said, We were looking at them, and yeah, it was a happy moment for them. I should just add here that the entire report by CNN, though short, is rather gut-wrenching and really shows the weight of losing an entire family to such an unexpected tragedy. You can only feel empathy when seeing Kim's dad break down as he explains who he blamed for his loss. Do you blame anyone for what's happened? Yes, the man who hits the, 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 the button to start the racket to, to, to blow up the, the, the airplane. If I get him, I, will. I could kill him. Damn. Damn. Damn, are you can say, oh my God. Like I said, y'all know people die every day, right? Yeah, people do die every day, but not every day somebody shot out the fucking sky, nigga. It's also really heartwarming seeing how they all finally remember the Hollies, even down to the tiniest little details. For instance, Monique says that Dave and Kim, quote, always wanted to win, which made her, Monique, and Kim's parents hopeful that even as the unidentified caskets were being offloaded in Holland, Dave, Kim, and their daughter would be first. I could go on and on dissecting that CNN feature, but I think you guys got the point. They were a loving family that became dearly missed from day one. And I believe that entire feature makes looking at Dave's last photo even more saddening. I mean, for instance, hearing Kim's mother mother narrate the last moments with them, saying goodbye to her granddaughter, Megan, as a family left for the airport, seeing their empty house, a family car outside, and flowers for the memorial. Then looking at that last photo makes one imagine the kind of gap that they left behind. Truly more than just a tragic tale of a photo captured before a disaster. And in case you were wondering, the investigations led to the prosecution of Igor Gurkin, a military officer, Sergei Dubinsky, an intelligence officer, and Leonid Karchenko, a military commander. All were found yeah. guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. This happened back in November of 2022, but interestingly, the investigations went on a little further. Turns out, and I already mentioned this, the prosecutors had strong indications that Russia's President Putin might have approved the missile launch, thus believing that more prosecutions could be made. The evidence was, however, not enough, leading to the end of the investigation in February of 2023. Much to the disappointment of the Netherlands, as their Prime Minister, Mark Root, said, we will continue to call the Russian Federation to account for its role in this tragedy. Damn, that's crazy. Pat Tillman's last photo. Next up is the incredibly sad case of Pat Tillman, whose death at the prime age of 27 would go on to unearth a rather complex web of alleged lies, cover-ups, and borderline sabotage actions by the US government, and maybe unsurprisingly, the US media. First, let's begin with the photo. This here is Pat. That photo was taken sometime before April 22, 2004, in southeastern Afghanistan's coast province, where Pat, a member of the 75th Ranger Regiment, was patrolling alongside his unit. That turned out to be the last photo ever taken of him because because on April 22nd, he would get killed. Three bullets to the head at close range. Now, one thing you should know about Pat is that he used to be an NFL player before enlisting in around 2002. Oh, the enlisting wow. was also right after the 9-11 attacks and his motive, clearly, was to stand up for his country in the face of terror. He'd enlisted to join the fight against Al-Qaeda and the effort to bring Osama bin Laden to justice. As this article from The Intercept explains, so the fact that he left behind a three point- He left behind a contract to fight for his country. In the same country you left to fight a war that you know you didn't have to be a part of. Literally, you volunteered because you love your country so much, and they did you so bruh. Damn. That nigga is a hero, but at what cost, bro? At what cost? Cause this country apparently covered some shit up about it. You couldn't even be forthcoming with his death. Like, that nigga could have been a millionaire. Nigga left behind millions. Six million dollar NFL contract with the Arizona Cardinals made his story jump right into the headlines as the Bush administration used it for pro war publicity. He became the living, breathing symbol of honor, sacrifice, and more. So, knowing all of this, you can see why his death in 2004 was a big deal. The Army, for instance, reporting that he'd been killed as he, quote, charged up a ridgeline, braving enemy fire, and defending his fellow soldiers, publicized the death flying helicopters over a stadium in his honor, broadcasting his memorial on live TV, awarding him a silver star and the Purple Heart, and 
and promoting him posthumously to corporal. A rather drastic twist, however, and this is where the lies began unraveling, came in when news spread that Pat wasn't killed by enemy fire, but rather by his own side. And while mostly wow. termed accidental, this became a contested view since the facts never added up. Army doctors, for instance, said the shots were, quote, suspicious due to the close proximity of the wounds. As news caught on, the army had to issue an announcement a month later, clarifying that indeed Pat had been killed by fellow soldiers. There were no enemies nearby, and they did so rather brutally because apparently as they took aim at him, he yelled, I'm Pat f***ing Tillman, trying to get them to stop. Those were the last words he'd ever speak. Even sadder though is the fact that it took years, seven official investigations, and two wow. congressional hearings for Pat's family to get some shreds of truth of what actually happened. Despite the army admitting that Pat had died of friendly fire, they hadn't offered much explanation. As Pat's mother, Mary Tillman, put it, they had no regard for him as a person, and they attached themselves to his virtue and then threw him under the bus. His brother, Kevin Tillman, who was serving under the same unit as him, also told Congress that as the evidence raised questions on the Army's version of events, an alternative narrative had been constructed. In short, they lied because they didn't want to be publicly embarrassed. Now, this is a pretty elaborate case, and there's a lot of stuff that I've left out, but the following words by Kevin Tillman sort of encapsulate the whole thing. Speaking to Congress in 2007, he said, The deception surrounding this case was an insult to the family, but more importantly, its primary purpose was to deceive a whole nation. Knowing all that, his last photo... They really... Bro, it's crazy how y'all... They use that nigga for publicity. And they used his death for publicity again, lying, saying he charged an enemy lines. No, he was killed by his own people. The people he went to go fight for. Like, let's be for... And then you, you did a public report. Oh, he's... You know, he he would die in a, in a firefight, you know, saving his... No. It was a senseless... Kid. He would die at the hands of his own niggas, bro. Niggas he was supposed to fight beside. Oh, my God. Suddenly carries way more depth. That is insane. Ayrton Senna's last photo. One of the most respected names in F1, from the 90s all the way to now, is Ayrton Senna. This is his last photo, taken moments before he got into a fatal crash. I'll come back to the crash, but first, why? Why is he one of the most respected names in F1? Well, while researching this, I found some F1 fans on Reddit claiming that even though the current heavyweights of the sport, talking about Lewis and Schumacher, have endless titles to their names, Senna still retains a legacy of being the best F1 driver ever for his incomparable skills. Now, since these could be mere claims, I dug a little and found found that it seems to be a very popular opinion. For instance, it turns out that Senna had a reputation for, quote, ruthless and risky maneuvers on the Grand Prix circuit. This means that even among the fastest, and you can already tell F1 drivers go pretty fast, he was still noticeably faster. Anyway, that kind of driving Damn. saw him quickly climb the ranks, soon becoming a professional driver with 41 Grand Prix titles and three circuit world championships to his name. He won three Formula One drivers championships in 1988, 1990, and 91. Also, having hailed from Sao Paulo, Brazil, his mere in F1 moving. meant he had set a bunch of other records. For example, he was one of three Formula One drivers from Brazil to have won the world championship at the time. Now, going back to how fast he was, clear evidence of that is the fact that for about 17 years, from 1989 to 2006, no other driver broke his record for the most pole positions. A pole position, in case you didn't know, simply means the most advantageous starting point during a race. It's earned by the driver who sets the fastest speed during the qualifying trials, which happens before race day. So yeah, pretty fast. And unfortunately, it was this strength and speed that turned out to be Senna's weakness. How so? Well, on May 1st, 1994, during the San Marino Grand Prix held at the Autodromo Enzo Edino Ferrari in Italy while leaving the race, Senna fatally crashed into a concrete barrier, with the incident being partially blamed on speed. This happened during the seventh lap when, during a corner named the Tamburello, his car left the racing line, ran in a straight path away from the track, and hit an unprotected concrete barrier. Data recovered from the wreckage revealed that Senna had been doing a staggering 192 miles per hour that's 390 god and kilometers per hour for my non-us viewers just but 192 straight into a fucking wall i'm bro there's nothing saving you from that 192 there's nothing bro going 192 miles per hour at a straight fucking there's nothing that could save you from that Damn. Damn. 
before the corner. He had then braked hard, shifting down twice to get slower right before hitting the wall at 131 miles per hour. That's oh. 211 kilometers per hour. The impact tore off the right front wheel and the nose cone as the car spun to a halt. Unfortunately, that wheel tore off and had bounced on the cockpit, hitting the front of his helmet, violently shoving him against the headrest, which had already been bent forward by the wall's impact. Senna not only suffered fractures to his skull, but also had head trauma as part of the suspension and upright assembly had penetrated his helmet. And although the medical professionals got to him while he was still alive, the head of the on-track medical team, Sid Watkins, said, We lifted him from the cockpit and laid him on the ground. As we did, he sighed and, although I'm not religious, I felt his spirit depart at that moment. Later, investigations were done and an Italian court blamed the accident on a, quote, hastily adapted steering column. This undeniably yeah. tragic event did lead to some positive changes, as it saw a revision of F1 rules about speed, runoff areas, track layouts, crash tests, and more, all to promote driver safety. Now, just like in all the previous cases, Ew. knowing all that, looking at Senna's last photo creates a much deeper empathy. He just said he felt his soul leave his body. That is insane to say. And you don't just you don't just say some shit like that. You really gotta like. Nigga said he let out a sigh and you felt he felt his soul leave his body. Oh my god. Nah, that that that's crazy photo before tsunami. This next story might just have you questioning just how often things can happen out of random chance. So the story is about John and Jackie Nill, a couple from Vancouver, Canada, who died when a tsunami hit a beach where they were vacationing in in Thailand. This happened back in December of 2004, right after Christmas on the 26th. This here is the very last photo they took before being swept away. Now, we'll come back to that couple, but first, let's talk about the story of Christian Pillay. So Pillay and his wife Nicole, both missionaries from Washington State, heard the news of the devastating tsunami that that hit Thailand and traveled alongside some of their colleagues to go offer some help. They booked a hotel room and got right to it. And this was a month after the tsunami, about January 26th. The interesting part of Pillay's story is that while walking down the beach at Khao Lak, his friend Cameron kicked something with his foot saying, look, it's a smashed digital camera. The camera itself was pretty obliterated and Pillay himself said finding it seemed like a non-event. However, this non-event would turn out to be extremely useful because when Pillay took the memory card out and plugged it into his Palm Pilot, what he saw were photos that captured the last moments of the beach before the tsunami hit. He said, We were watching these pictures, seeing people live their lives, enjoying themselves, having a wonderful vacation, and then it was as if we had picked up a tape recorder and heard somebody's last conversation and then it just ended suddenly. Unknown to him, Ew. it was John and Jackie Nill's final moments captured on camera. So, how did the camera end up at the beach? Well, going back to the couple, it turns out- Damn! that they had visited Thailand several times before, enough to consider it their second home. On that specific vacation, when the tsunami hit, they had been there a while, enjoying themselves as usual, and everything had been fine. They even called their children on December 25th to wish them a Merry Christmas, and the next day, the 26th, they woke up early to go to the beach to cap- Oh, I would hate- I ain't gonna lie, I would hate Christmas forever. Yeah, we definitely gotta watch something happy after this. Jesus. You get a call from your parents, they on vacation, having a time of their life. They call you to wish you Merry Christmas, and then the next day, I, I'd probably, I'd never celebrate again, like ever. Captured the beautiful moments and brought along their digital camera. While at the beach, they spotted a large wave from a distance and, unaware of the impending danger, began taking photos of it. I believe these were the photos that Pele described as hearing someone's last conversation. Here are some of those photos. You can easily make out that the wave can be seen in the far horizon in the first photo, and it builds with each photo. And you know what's crazy? Like, a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people don't know Here this. Here are some of those. But, like, when the water's pulled back that far, that's signs of a tsunami, bro. That's literally signs of a tsunami. How like the water is as, as it doesn't it looks real shallow compared to that's photos. signs of you a tsunami. You can easily make out that the wave can be seen all the far water horizon is in the, the first back, photo. That it wave. builds with each photo to a very close up range in the last one. They must have been swept off right after. Now the couple's children, Patrick, David, and Christian, after seeing the news of the disaster and failing to get in contact with their parents, had John Nill's brother-in-law travel to Thailand and search for their bodies. He succeeded as on December 31st, 2004, John's body was found, and later on January 13th, 2005, Jackie's yeah. body was also found. It's not clear what happened 
happened after, but undoubtedly, no one would have known the couple's last moments had Pelé not only randomly found the camera, but also made an effort to reach out to the family and share the photos with them. Patrick, one of the couple's sons, while admitting that it was hard to look at the pictures, said he was glad they had them, as he could then sleep better at night. He added that the pictures helped him imagine that there was nothing his parents could do to avoid the tsunami, and that maybe they chose to, quote, sit there at a place they loved. Damn. Darsh Patel's last photo. On Sunday, September 21st, 2014, Darsh Patel, a Rutgers University student and four of his university friends, decided to go hiking at the Upshawa Preserve in West Milford, New Jersey. Carrying granola bars and water, this would have been a perfectly normal hike if it wasn't for one bear that was stalking them. Yes, a black bear. A ba fucking bear? Oh my god. A bear? Why oh, this make me never want to go outside, bro? Bear stalked the group, killing one of them, that being Darsh Patel, and mauled him to death. Darsh was only 22 years old. Interestingly, or rather bizarrely, the attack, which authorities called highly unusual, happened just before Patel took this photo of the 300-pound black bear from a- Of the- Inga took a photo of the fucking bear. Not knowing you about to dot it at motherfucker. Oh my god. About 100 feet or 30 meters away. Actually, he took a total of five photos with the bear seeming to get closer with each shot. It was after the pictures were taken that the bear truly came after them, with the chase beginning when it had already gotten too close, just 15 feet away. Maybe they ran yeah. in different directions with the bear just coincidentally aiming for Patel. The police statement issued by Timothy Storbeck, the town's chief of police, actually confirms this as in full it reads, the group of five hikers encountered a black bear in the woods that began to follow them. They became frightened and attempted to flee the area. During the confusion, the group became separated as they ran in different locations. When they later regrouped, they discovered Patel was missing and immediately called the police. A search immediately ensued, and it wasn't until two hours later that Patel's body was found. He had sustained several bites and claw marks, even his phone, which had the last photos that he took, had been gouged by the bear as it had fang marks. The search team, which included wow. West Milford Police and the Environmental Protection Department, also found the bear nearby and, studying for a bit, reported that strangely it didn't seem interested in food and exhibited quote stalking type of behavior. It was also weird that the bear stayed about 30 yards from where Patel's body lay, just circling and wouldn't leave until the officer scared it away. The police then decided to euthanize it or more like shoot it down. A necropsy, which is basically an autopsy for animals, was then performed and it was revealed that the bear had ingested human tissue, clothing, blood, and had blood on its paws. Now, while Damn. Patel's death was the first death to ever be attributed to a bear in New Jersey, this wasn't the first time that that's specific bear had been sighted. Turns out that it had been seen by locals just hours before looking for food. Experts confirmed that it wasn't uncommon to spot black bears in New Jersey. Bob Considine, the spokesman for the Department of Environmental Protection, for instance, said, bear sightings are not unusual by any stretch in New Jersey, and more often than not, these bears pose no threat to humans as they retreat when confronted. Maybe that's what Patel and his friends thought, that they could possibly scare it away, only that this specific bear was different as authority. Nah, bro. That nigga is at Martin, bro. He was on the hunt. That nigga was on the prowl. Authorities put it due to its stalking and predatory behavior. It was also confirmed that. I'm sorry. The song, the mystical song, came to my head, but I wasn't gonna say it. But it like came to my head. It. I didn't say it. But you. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. You know what I meant, like, I, like, it's, it was just, it, like, it's, it was, okay. Patel and his friends. What song was it, though? Okay, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna just keep playing. It had not provoked the bear at all, only maybe attracting its attention by taking a few nature shots. And because I know this might cross your mind, let me add that commenting on the story, Lawrence Hajna, an expert advised that when encountering a bear, quote, remain calm and do not run. Make sure the bear has an escape route, avoid direct eye contact, back up slowly, and speak with a low but assertive voice. Interestingly though, right after that advice, Lawrence added, it's easier said than done. Damn. Bud Dwyer's no one you didn't have to put it in the chat bro you didn't have to put it in the chat bro come on bro we we, we moved on we moved past it bro 
I'm not making. It's just like it's crazy how it kind of played out. But I'm not making fun of the niggas death or nothing. It's just. His last photo. Next up is this photo of Bud Dwyer, a man who, hey. in an incredibly disturbing twist, took his own life on television <laughs> on January. Why did you finish the line, Peg? Come on, man. This nigga finished it. I'm bro. Come on, bro. Oh my god. Come on. A man who, in an incredibly disturbing twist, took his own life on television. On January what? 22nd, 1987, burdened by a case of corruption and bribery, Dwyer shot himself on live TV. In the photo that I have just shown you, this one was taken moments before he did that. Now, Dwyer, born and bred in Missouri, had actually been a rather accomplished politician before any allegations were leveled against him. He had risen from the position of the 6th District Representative in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives in 1964 to holding the office of Pennsylvania Treasurer in 1984. His journey saw him get re-elected for some of the positions, and of course, his name grew bigger with each election cycle. All th his the video of him pulling out the hammers on YouTube. Is it? Thanks to his tenacious spirit and sheer commitment to public service. This, however, took a drastic turn for him in 1984 when it was revealed that public employees in Pennsylvania from 1979 to 1981 had overpaid millions of dollars in taxes following an error that had caused tax deductions even when employees were on sick leave. In a bid Damn. to fix the mess, attempting to recover up to $40 million in Social Security taxes, Dwyer hired Computer Technology Associates, CTA, a small data processing company operating in Newport Beach, California, and CTA would get paid $4.6 million dollars for the work. It was fishy though that such a big contract went to a firm with three full-time employees and the competitive bidding process wasn't done. That however became the least of Dwyer's worries because about two months later on July 11th he learned the FBI was looking into CTA for having bribed other public officials in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County to get similar contracts. He rescinded the CTA contract but it was too late. It turns out that his political Simba don't search it up you remember your blippy curiosity. He just, he fucking just dropped. I didn't play the sound. I didn't play the sound. I didn't play the sound. Jesus. Somebody gonna say, look. Look, look. Did he died. No, nah. stupid. No, nah, he did. Gone to the fucking. Did he died? Fucking idiot. No fucking shit, Sherlock. Nah, he just had. He took a bullet for fucking lunch. Stupid nigga. Oh my god. Nigga said his. <laughs> nigga just broke his shields political opponent, General Al Benedict, who had been eyeing the treasurer position, had obtained a sworn statement from Janice R. Kincaid, a former vice president at CTA, that implicated Dwyer. That meant rescinding the contract would do nothing to save him. The statement, widely circulated by Benedict, claimed that Dwyer received a kickback of $300,000 from CTA for the irregularly awarded contract. That's about $885,000 in today's money. Now, political smearing or not, these allegations were really damning to Dwyer's career. It also didn't help that his opponent, General Al 
Benedict had gone to great lengths to find information that would make him look bad. For example, the same statement also read that Mrs. Kinclade had been asked by CTA, her employer, to do, quote, anything she needed to make any of their customers happy. That was taken to strongly indicate, at least according to her, a request to offer sexual favors to clients. Now, these allegations had been quite extensive, involving others beyond Dwyer, with a CTA employee even alleging that her boss had a secret Swiss bank account holding $400,000. All the factors considered, it was estimated that it would at least take several months to fully investigate, and interestingly, as the investigations ensued, Dwyer termed the whole thing as a nightmare that just won't go away. He would then go on to try to frustrate the investigations, but the court oh, eventually he had charged him with 11. This, is, this isn't even a picture, this is a video. He had the blick in hand. I never even noticed, noticed that this was blurred. Yeah, Chad, that fucking gun was, this is the blick in hand counts of conspiracy, mail fraud, perjury, and interstate transportation in aid of racketeering. He faced 55 years in prison. Feeling cornered, he called for a press conference at the Pennsylvania State Capitol building in Harrisburg on January 22, 1987, and as reported by the New York Times, red-faced and sweating, Mr. Dwyer drew a 357 Magnum revolver from a manila envelope, and before anyone got to him, he put the barrel of the pistol in his mouth and pulled the trigger. He died about 30 minutes later. It was later discovered that knowing he would off himself, he asked for a letter to be delivered to Robert P. Casey, the then Pennsylvania governor. The letter detailed his dissatisfaction with the justice system, saying it did not, quote, function properly, and also requested that his wife, Joanne Dwyer, be appointed the interim treasurer. A pretty chilling case. I know it's very popular to talk about the actual video, since yes, there is a video of him doing that action, but I just thought it was, uh, it's really talked about, and I, I didn't even know there was a final image of him, so I uh, just wanted to bring that to Damn, light. that's crazy. Vicky Weaver's last photo. The last photo on our list is this one here of Vicky Weaver, whose death was probably avoidable had the FBI followed tactical procedures as set in the Constitution. How so? Well, Vicky died from a gunshot in August of 1992 at her family's cabin in Ruby Ridge, Idaho. This happened when an FBI sniper, Lon Hiriuchi, during a standoff with Vicky's husband, Randy Weaver, fired a shot aimed at Kevin Harris, Randy's friend, only for it to end up hitting and killing Vicky. As argued in court by Jerry Spence, the Weaver's attorney, the sniper didn't need to fire the shots because first, firing at an armed adult without warning them to surrender is unconstitutional. Second, the shots were fired while Randy and Kevin, the primary targets, were in retreat. And third, the sniper placed Vicky and her children at risk by firing at the cabin's door, not knowing who was behind it. As a matter of fact, the court upheld these charges leading to the US government incurring hefty fines. Randy and his three daughters were awarded $3.1 million for the tragic loss of Sammy, their teenage son, and Vicky. Just an insert here, Sammy, age 14, had actually been shot after allegedly firing at the FBI agents who had killed the family's dog that had charged at them. It would later be highly contested as to who actually fired first. Anyway, moving on. Damn. So you shot the son. For, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah. Nah, that's, that's, yeah. That's a, yeah, I would have sued they ass too. I would have sued they ass too. You think I'm not gonna wanna blink at you? I got a, I got a gun. I'm not shooting at you yet. But you go ahead and just shoot my dog? Nigga, you shoot my dog, call me fucking John Wick, nigga. They shot the 14 year old boy. They shot the boy because he shot at them because they shot his dog, literally. Call me fucking John Wick, nigga. I'm, I'm, fa fa. the fuck? Y'all on my property. The It's a fucking dog. At the end of the day, he's gonna try to protect his owner. You could have pulled out a stun gun or something. You just sh shot and fucked my fucking... Call me John Wick. Call me John Wick. Tragic loss of Sammy, their teenage son, and Vicky. Just an insert here. Sammy, age 14, had actually been shot after allegedly firing at the FBI agents who had killed the family's dog that had charged at them. It would... Call me John. Hey. Everybody gonna die. Later be highly contested as to who actually fired first. Anyway, moving on, Kevin was also awarded compensation, receiving $380,000, though this was in part to encourage him to drop the $10 million lawsuit he had mounted against the government. Now, what's really no. unhinged about this whole case is that it all started with a refusal by Randy to show up for a court hearing where he had been accused by ATF agents of, quote, making and keeping illegal weapons. Apparently, he had missed a court hearing in February 1991 and also March of that same year. So, the entire incident 
was set in motion due to not showing up to court, and that escalated to a disturbing shootout that led to multiple deaths. I also don't think it helped that Randy had been a self-proclaimed white separatist and religious fundamentalist who didn't trust the government at all. In fact, the entire reason he was living in a cabin with no electricity or running water was to seclude himself from the corrupt civilization. The religious beliefs also made him believe that the world was coming to an end. It also seems that the standoff would have kept going if it weren't for civilian negotiator Bo Gritz, who convinced Randy to let Vicky's body be taken out of the cabin and for the critically injured Kevin to get medical help, and second, to surrender himself to law enforcement. Before I end this off, I do want to say yeah. rest in peace to all the people that I have spoken about in this video. Nah, term, call me John Wick. Call me fucking John Wick. I'm... Well guys, that was the end of this video. If you guys do like the way I presented this information, it would be awesome if you could leave a like on the video. I hope I earned your subscription. And if you want to watch a less sad video, you can go watch the blippy one, for example. The blippy one? It's not sad, but that shit is fucking... Like I said, if you want to watch a less sad video, watch the blippy one. About shit? No, nah, I'm good. I'm good. That'd be video though, Tuff. That'd be vid. That'd be vid. Beep. <laughs>